Hello and welcome to this video on control, punishment and victims. When it comes to crime prevention and control, sociologists ask themselves what can be done to prevent crime or if indeed anything can be done. What makes people conform to the law and to the norms of society, but also what makes them deviate and what role should social control play, what role indeed should the state play. There are three main different approaches to crime prevention and control, the first of which is situational crime prevention. Now these ideas were mostly the work of Ron Clark, a new right and right realist style sociologist, although he has some help with some other sociologists as well. His aim was to look for ways in which individuals could reduce opportunities for crime. He argued that most crime was opportunistic, that is, a criminal sees an opportunity and they seize that opportunity. So if you reduce those opportunities, then crime should come down. And so he espoused an approach known as target hardening. That is, that all of us can do something pretty much all of the time to make it harder for ourselves to become a target of crime. So, for example, locking your doors when you leave the house, locking your windows at night, installing CCTV could be all ways in which you could reduce the likelihood that you would be a victim of crime and you can harden yourselves as a target or potential target. This is based on rational choice theory, the idea that all of us as human beings, whenever we make a decision, we weigh up the pros and the cons. And so this supposed, say, burglar who might break into your house he or she is going to look at the house and say, OK, well, they've locked their door, they've locked their windows, they've put up some CCTV. Doesn't really make sense. I'm probably not going to get away with it. So rationally, I'm not going to burgle that house. Whereas another house that perhaps hasn't engaged in target hardening, they may become a legitimate target for that burglar. This is contrasted with other root causes theories that we'll be looking at, which would claim that actually crime is a product of things like poverty and racism. Instead, it's very much about individuals making rational decisions. So to reiterate, what Ron Clark is saying here is that we need to focus on the immediate situation in all times and realise that most crime is opportunistic. It's about if an opportunity is there, someone may take it. Therefore, if we reduce the opportunities for crime, Therefore, there should be less crime. It's kind of like an equation, if you will. Marcus Felsen kind of chimes in here and said that perhaps we can go one further. And when it comes to organising and kind of laying out and in fact designing our societies and our communities, that perhaps we can design crime out. And one particular example he points to is Port Authority in New York, which is a place where coaches from all over the country come to. That's kind of the, the port of court, if you will. Um, and around Port Authority, traditionally, it's been a lot of crime. In particular, there's lots of kind of drug dealers. Um, there are prostitutes, there are homeless people, and one specific aspect of this he zoomed in on was the homeless and how in Port Authority, in the public toilets or bathrooms, as they would say in America, um, there were quite large sinks and homeless people would bathe in them. And so one of the things they decided to do was to shrink the sinks so they were just hand basins. And then overnight, you didn't have people now bathing in them. And in fact, a lot of homeless people just thought, well, it's not really an area worthwhile me kind of hanging out with anymore. So they kind of moved on. So in that sense, by making small changes, you can design crime out of your community. However, obviously, the big issue here is that doesn't necessarily mean that all crime stops. Instead, what we tend to see is what we call displacement. Uh, so situational control theories only displace crime. They move it, if you will. So we saw also in New York where there had been a crackdown on subway crime. So the subway, as in the tube in New York, um, had an issue with gangs uh, fighting, dealing drugs, and of course also prostitutes operating in that area. So there was a big push made by the police there to try and crack down on this. And sure enough, the, the metro became kind of a cleaner, safer place. Um, however, it didn't mean that those crimes ended. They just moved. They went elsewhere. They went back onto the streets, as it were, and became a problem for whoever was using the streets. So in addition to spatial displacement, where the crime happens simply somewhere else, so not on the subway, but now on the streets, you also have temporal, which is when it happens at another time, target, which is when it's a different victim, tactical, where there's a different method, and even functional, when someone commits a completely different crime. So someone's desperate for money, uh, but instead of mugging someone, they're now going to burgle a house, that would be functional displacement. In terms of evaluation, there's much to say that this situational crime prevention theory works and that target hardening is useful, but it does cause some displacement. 
It's good for focusing on street crime, which is opportunistic, but perhaps wouldn't really help us deal with, say, white collar or corporate crime. There's a lot of assumption here with regards to rational choice. You know, do we all as human beings make rational choices? Sometimes we do things which are irrational. There's a complete ignorance here or failure to talk about root causes like poverty and racism. And some sociologists would focus on the CCTV aspect of target hardening and say that it's problematic, that what tends to happen is the people who watch the CCTV streams often focus on young males from black Asian minority ethnic backgrounds and perhaps also working class too. Um, whereas in particular, feminists would say that the CCTV is an extension of the male gaze. So really it's a way in which men observe women and seek to control them. So because of this, CCTV is problematic. Our next crime prevention strategy is environmental crime prevention, and this is rooted in the work of Wilson and Kelling and their broken windows theory, which states that if a window is broken, say in your local community or town or village or whatever it might be, that it acts as kind of a signal to anyone in the area who might be interested in committing criminal or deviant acts that they'd probably get away with it because if it remains broken it sort of says that no one really cares about this area that the police aren't policing it no one's looking after it so you'll probably get away with it and so they also twin this by saying that police typically only really focus their time on the more serious crimes like murder and they tend to ignore the more petty stuff and that this is the beginning of a spiral of decline it's the thin end of the wedge so to put it simply, absence of control leads to crime. You need to control your local area in order to bring crime down. How do you do this? Well, firstly, through an environmental improvement strategy. That is making sure that, say, the lights are always on in the streets at night time, that you clean up any litter and graffiti, that you fix those broken windows and so on. At the same time, you need the police having a zero tolerance approach to policing, which is they don't just focus on the more serious crime, they focus on the basics. So if someone urinates in the street, they need to be fined. Um, if someone's drunk in the street, they need to be taken in or taken home. If a prostitute is soliciting, they need to be arrested and so on and so forth. And the example they point to, Wilson and Kelling, is New York City once again. That in the subway, there used to be an issue with graffiti. And so an attempt was made to implement a clean car policy where any time any graffiti sort of turned up, it would be cleaned off the carriages um, that evening so that the next morning when it went out, everything would be pristine. And what happened is over time, the graffiti artists themselves started to realise it was a waste of time, money, energy, effort. So they just stopped doing it. And sure enough, the carriages became clean all of the time. So this was seen as a success of this particular crime prevention strategy. Another example, again in New York, was cracking down on what are known as squeegee merchants. So these are the individuals who kind of sometimes jump out in front of cars at um, red lights and kind of try and clean the windscreen of people's cars and then get a bit of money for it. And when there was a crackdown on it, it was discovered that many of those individuals had warrants out for outstanding crimes. So some of them were already known to be drug dealers or arranged and in, involved in um, organised crime. And so by cracking down on them, they actually removed other criminals off the streets. In terms of evaluation, it's very difficult to know exactly how much zero tolerance worked in New York City when it was attempted in the 80s and early 90s, because at the same time that it was implemented, a whole range of other stuff was going on. In particular, lots more police officers were being recruited and a lot more money was being spent just generally on uh, policing. So that might have played a role too. Furthermore, one of the other kind of criticisms of this is that it criminalises very, very petty deviance and this we call net widening. And so should we really be focusing on the people urinating in the street at night, even if it's undesirable, should we not have our police officers out there trying to catch the murderers and the rapists instead? Our third and final uh, crime prevention strategy is social and community crime prevention. This aims to remove the conditions which predispose individuals to crime in the first place. So very much connected to the idea of root causes that there is stuff going on in society like poverty, like unemployment, like um, housing issues. And this is what causes people to turn to crime. It's a very long term strategy because you need to invest now and the kind of output or the kind of take home from this will be visible many years down the line. So something to bear in mind. And that will come up when we think about the evaluation here. So if you were to reduce unemployment in the long term, it should have the, the consequence of lowering crime, even though that's not specifically the intention of reducing unemployment, it's kind of a, a positive outcome of it. 
The specific example here is the Perry Preschool Project, which was in Michigan, uh, where supplementary education was introduced uh, in a particular school, in a particular class, where students were majority black and working class and you know, traditionally were coming from communities where there was a problem of criminality and deviance. And the people in that class were studied over 40 years. They received, whilst they were in school, extra educational um, kind of support. They had people go home and make sure that their parents were kind of stimulating them. And the outcome of the project was that for every $1 that was invested, it saved $17 in the long term because many of those or most of those people who involved did not go on to commit crime, did not go on to um, uh, need unemployment benefit, did not go on to require state housing and so on and so forth. So actually, in the long term, it saved a lot of money, but in the short term, it was very expensive. And this is the problem. This is the evaluation that I hinted at earlier. It's very expensive. It's very long term. You've got to wait 40 years plus for this to really just state. And governments in democracies generally think in much shorter time periods because they always think about the next general election. And so they are unlikely to invest in this kind of scheme en masse. So unfortunately, whilst it might work, uh, it's something that probably will never quite really be implemented. Our next section we need to consider is punishment. There are generally two justifications given for punishing a human being. Firstly, the reduction of future crime, either through deterrence, so deterring people from wanting to commit crime in the first place, that they know that they will get uh, punished, or deterring people from them committing the crime again if they've been punished previously. An example of this could be Margaret Thatcher's short shot shock treatment. So this was for teenage delinquents. They had to spend two weeks essentially in prison if they were caught. And this acted as a kind of shock to the system that made them realise, oh, I, I don't want this. Instead, I'm going to make sure that I don't commit to a life of crime. Next, rehabilitation. So trying to rehabilitate people who have committed crimes um, back into society so they can become an upstanding citizen once again. So basically fixing them, mending them from their, their erroneous ways. And finally, incapacitation, which is protecting the public. So taking someone away from the public and putting them in a box, which is essentially what a prison is. And an example could be in America, there was the three strikes and you're out principle, which was if you got caught for three petty crimes or three crimes at all, um, then on the third time, you would absolutely have a prison sentence that would be considered rather long. So, again, it's incapacitating people, removing them from society. It's worth remembering that in America also they have the death penalty, which you could say is the ultimate form of incapacitation. The other justification is retribution. So things like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. If someone has committed a crime against you, you want them to have some sort of pain, if you will, visited upon them. That if you do the crime, you should do the time to pay back to society. So in many ways, this is about vengeance on behalf of society for that individual breaking the social contract or in a more kind of functional sense, upsetting the shared value consensus. Thinking of functionalism, we can consider here the work of Durkheim who argued that the role of punishment was to reinforce social solidarity and shared values. He said that there are two types of justice, one from the past and one more so from the present or in modern society. Uh, so firstly, retributive justice, which comes from the word retribution, the idea that society has a strong collective conscience, as everyone is very similar and has similar roles, and therefore what you have done has offended that collective conscience, has offended society, and so you want the wrongdoer to feel vengeance visited upon them. That actually society wants to lash out and hurt that person for upsetting the equilibrium of society. And Durkheim argued that this is what you saw in more kind of traditional societies or societies in the past, whereas today we have restitutive justice, which comes from the word to restore. The idea that individuals are more specialised nowadays, we're more likely to work in a kind of individual basis in a division of labour, we're more different from one another than we were in the past, but of course we're still all interdependent, thinking about the organic analogy. Crime, once again, has upset or disrupted the equilibrium, you know, the way in which we all rely on each other and need each other. So again, we want them punished to help restore order. Basically, we want to go back to the way it was before. We want to restore the situation as it was. Marxists take a slightly different view of punishment. Uh, in particular, we think here about the work of Louis Althusser, uh, who would argue that the criminal justice system and the justice within it and the punish that it visits is part of the repressive state apparatus. It's a, a tool that the bourgeoisie use to control society. It's the way in which they defend their property, their position of power and their privilege. 
what the CJS has, and in particular, um, obviously the court system, the police, and then the prison system, is what we call the ability to create an agency of fear. So the idea that all sort of law-abiding proletarians are terrified and fearful that they could be ripped away from their families, ripped away from their lives and put into prison, or perhaps worse, thinking about the past, then this sort of creates a climate where they think, well, I'm going to always do as I'm told because I don't want that to happen to me. What's interesting uh, about the Marxist perspective is how they identify that capitalism punishes workers by removing their capability to earn wages, which, if you think about it, within a capitalist society is often seen as the purpose of living, having a good job, providing for yourself and your family. So, again, once again, in a kind of traditional Marxist sense, really focusing on the economic nature uh, of the root of punishment. So capitalism turns a worker's time into money. So we've often heard that phrase that time is money, hence why in prisons you do time to pay for your crimes. Furthermore, we can also see similarities between the workplace and prison. So in both scenarios, you are subordinated by someone who's in a position of power above you, either the prison guard or your boss, and you lose your freedom because whilst you're at work, you've got to do as you're told and follow instructions and meet deadlines. And whilst you're in prison, well, you've got to do as you're told and you know stay in your cell or have dinner at this time and you only get a certain amount of time outside and so on. So actually, this is linked to the uh, work of Bowles and Gintis and the correspondence principle, perhaps. Michel Foucault comes at punishment from a postmodernist perspective, although he himself never called himself a postmodernist. And he would say that punishment has changed over time as forms of power have changed. So in the past, societies were based on sovereign power, where you had an absolute monarch, an absolute king or queen or emperor who had total power and total control over people's bodies. They owned the land, they owned the stuff in the land, and they owned the people themselves. And so they had the right to punish those bodies, those people, if you had done something with your body which they didn't like. So they might use capital or corporal punishment to either destroy the body or to harm the body, cut bits off, stretch it, slice it open, whatever it was. And that was them kind of displaying their power. And it wasn't just about doing that to the individual. It was also who the rest of society saw it happen. And you think about it, lots of capital and corporal punishment used to happen in public settings, in squares. And families would go and watch this so they could be kind of inspired in awe of the kind of horrific nature of it, but also the power of the monarch as an extension of that. Today, however, we've moved away from that type of power. Instead, we have disciplinary power, Foucault argues which is where it's not really about controlling the body, although sometimes we still do that by putting people in prisons uh, or perhaps even using curfews. Today, we look to control the mind and maybe in a sort of more spiritual sense, the soul. It's more about controlling people's thoughts, people's kind of uh, beliefs, their ideas, their ideologies, their values. And what Foucault does to kind of explain this is he uses the concept of the panopticon. Now, a panopticon is actually a type of prison and when I turn the slide you'll see some pictures of it which was designed by Jeremy Bentham whereby you could have a single guard potentially in the middle who was able to see into many many prisons, uh, prisoners rooms their, their, their cells and as a result uh, that gave that prison guard lots and lots of power and what the prisoners had to assume is that they were constantly being watched and it meant therefore that the prisoners didn't do anything untoward or didn't do anything they shouldn't be doing they kind of obeyed by the rules and what Foucault's going to argue, or does argue, is that in fact, today, we don't need to be disciplined or policed in the way we were in the past, because instead we do this ourselves, because we feel like we're constantly being watched. We feel like we're constantly being observed, either by CCTV or other kind of electronic devices or ways in which we are being tracked, or by each other. We actually watch each other. We discipline each other. We police each other. And of course, institutions play a role in that too, so much so that now we kind of almost school ourselves, we police ourselves in our own mind. And in a sense, we're in that cell, we're in that prison cell being watched by an invisible guard that may or may not exist. So we actually live within the panopticon. Society is the panopticon. This is how justice operates. And we don't need people to come and harm our bodies because we are completely controlled and we're less likely to commit crime and deviance as a result. So here's a few images just to help us visualise what the panopticon would look like. We can see the idea of there being the guard or guards in the middle, and you've got the prisoners arrayed around the sides of what might be a circle. And the idea is that all the prisoners have to assume all of the time they're being watched, 
in many ways, if we kind of scale this up to society, you know, it's the idea that we're all those individuals in those cells living our lives, doing what we do. But we assume all of the time that we're being watched, either by family members, either by people in society, either by professionals, medical or um, those related to the justice system, police officers. And of course, the ever watchful eye of CCTV, our smartphones recording everything about us. All of this leads us to believe we're being watched. So we self-police, we self-discipline. Thinking about prisons momentarily and the panopticon, it's worth saying that you know not many panopticons have been built. Supposedly they're rather expensive and they don't necessarily always work in the way that perhaps Jeremy Bentham meant. But prisons are still considered you know, vast parts of the world and in the West to be the kind of main way in which we punish people. Historically, prisons were where you were held until you were punished. In fact, uh, you either afterwards then went to jail or you uh, were kind of physically punished so you might be killed or you might be whipped or something like that and then you'd be free to go it's only since the enlightenment that freedom has been thought of as a right and so therefore prison has become a form of punishment in, in itself because what punishment what it does is it takes away your freedom it takes away your ability to move and do what you want to do so now it's a form of punishment whereas in the past it's just a place you were held until you were punished in liberal democracies like the UK, imprisonment is generally considered the harshest form of punishment, although, of course, we do have the caveat of somewhere like America where they still use, in some states, the death penalty. However, prisons aren't perfect. They often fail to re rehabilitate people in the way we would like. We often have this issue in the UK of reoffending or recidivism, and it's something that hasn't been cracked, and multiple governments across many, many years don't really know how to work it out. So much so that some would even argue that prisons are really a college of crime, that you go there often very young when perhaps you've been caught for some very small, petty act. And what happens in there is you do a bit of networking. Before you know it, you've made a whole host of connections in the criminal underworld. And so the problem is, is it's almost educating people how to commit crime. We've seen a huge explosion in the prison population over the last 40 years across the whole world, but in particular in America. It's argued, in particular by Marxists, that there might be an ideological function to this. So in the US, prison soaks up from about 30 to 40 percent of the unemployed, which makes capitalism look far more successful because those people now aren't sort of littering the streets being unemployed. Uh, we've also seen recently a movement away from justice as rehabilitation to being tough on crime in America, um, governments wanting to be seen as being strict on law and order. But we're not immune to that also in the UK. It's something which, you know, whenever there's a general election, it's very normal for politicians to want to appear to be tough on crime um, because it's something which chimes very well with the electorate. People like to think of their government as being tough on criminals. The war on drugs produces an almost limitless supply of arrestable and imprisonable offenders. So especially over the last sort of 40 years since the war on drugs was kind of declared, we've seen the numbers, numbers of um, people going to prison increase. And that's because related to the drugs um, industry, there are so many potential, potential kind of roles which could, of course, lead to crime. Increasingly, individuals are spending their lives under the control and surveillance of powerful institutions. And this is known as transcarceration, where people are perhaps in care homes or young offenders institutions, prisons, mental hospitals, and so on. As a result, the lines between the criminal justice system and welfare system have been kind of blurred. And often we can't tell where one begins and the other ends. They also share intelligence, they share information, they share databases. And these total institutions, people can find themselves stuck in them or moving between them, hence transcarceration, their whole lives or for many, many years. Uh, and these institutions regulate and exert huge power over individuals. And again, perhaps we could see this as an example of what Foucault meant by the panopticon. The final section we need to consider is victimology, the study of victims. So a victim is an individual who is harmed through acts or omissions, that's failing to do something, that violate the laws of the state, so says the United Nations. However, victimhood is socially constructed. It's created by society as well as the stereotype of the ideal victim, and this varies from society to society. The study of victims, victimology, helps us to understand the criminal justice system better. They are a source of evidence, because obviously you can ask a victim what happened, and often they are the only first-hand witnesses, so that is particularly useful in a kind of court scenario, but also for us as sociologists if we were doing research in this area. There are two types of victimology. Firstly, positivist victimology. This aims to identify patterns of victimization, what makes some individuals or groups more likely to be victims. So it's very much about quantitative data and looking at the trends and patterns within it. 
Positivist victimologists would argue that there is a sense of victim proneness. That is, some people are more likely to be victims, in particular females, the elderly, the mentally ill. And secondly, that some people invite crime upon themselves through things such as ostentatious displays of wealth. So if you're showing off what you have, in many ways you're kind of asking for crime to come visit you. Positive victimologists in their work like to focus on interpersonal crimes of violence. This is where you've got a couple of people maybe having a fight, and unfortunately one of them might come out the loser and perhaps die. And what they're interested in is how perhaps that individual precipitated their own kind of victimhood. So victim precipitation. The victim triggers events leading to crime being committed against them. They like to focus on murder, as I said, where the outcome of the act could have gone two ways, but instead it happened this way, and they want to look at why. How did that person bring it upon themselves? So in a sense, they're very much about identifying victims who have contributed to their own victimization. To evaluate, well, these guys kind of ignore other factors such as structural factors, the poverty, the patriarchy, the racism, and so on. And to an extent, we could say perhaps they're victim blaming, that they're kind of saying to people, it's your own fault that you're a victim. And that's very, very problematic, especially morally, when we think about something like rape, to sort of almost say that, well, they brought it upon themselves. It's not really a sound argument and wouldn't really stand up in a court of law and shouldn't really in a kind of a sociological debate. So by way of summary, positivist victimology focuses on victim proneness and precipitation. Critical victimology is somewhat different. Critical victimologists focus on structural factors, so patriarchy, poverty, racism, and how this places certain powerless groups at greater chance of victimization. They refer to this as structural victimization. They also look at the state's power to apply or deny the label of victim. So victim, crime and criminal are all socially constructed concepts. Again, they vary from society to society. And the state reserves the power to label and to withhold that status. And to have that withheld means that there's a whole range of things that suddenly you're not able to access and you're not viewed in a certain light in society. So that's a big power to have. Critical victimologists look at safety crimes, so how bosses who victim blame their workers for being accident prone, when in reality it's probably because health and safety legislation wasn't being followed, so really they're to blame. They look at the ideological function of the failure to label, so how it helps to conceal the true extent of victimisation, so we don't really know how many victims there are or how much victimization is going on so we're talking here about the dark figure of crime once again it hides also the crimes of the powerful they're very good at being able to hide the crimes they've committed we also see critical victimologists talk about the hierarchy of victimization how the powerless in society are the most likely to be victimized but are least able to have this acknowledged so when we're thinking about those who are marginalized those who are socially excluded these people's sort of victimhood is essentially kind of invisible and ignored by way of evaluation then, well, positivist victimologists would say surely there is some scenarios where a victim might have brought it upon themselves. Could we not all be doing a bit of target hardening to reduce the likelihood of us being a victim of crime? And it must be said in sense of balance, however, that it's very good at identifying the role of power in constructing victim status. This doesn't come out of a vacuum. So in terms of a summary, critical victimology emphasises structural factors such as poverty and the state's power to apply or deny the label of victim. In the United Kingdom, when we come to look at patterns of victimisation, the average chance of an individual being the victim of crime in any one year is about one in four. However, the risk is very unevenly distributed between different social groups, so that one in four figure hides you know, the reality of what it means to be from a certain group in our society. So in the simplest way, the poor, and in here we're thinking about the working class and the underclass, the young, people under the age of 21, and ethnic minority groups, more likely to suffer from racist discrimination, are at greater risk of victimisation. That's it. Thank you very much.